Thank you. Uh, thank you to Jan Marius for inviting me here. Uh, it was uh, nice to... I've been down in uh, Bergen for the last couple of months, so uh, I've been kind of seeing uh, that end of the country. been over to Oslo a few times but, uh, when uh, Jan Marius uh, invited me up here. I couldn't pass up the opportunity to come up to Tromso and see this uh, different part of the country, right? So uh, it's been a good experience being here in uh, Norway for the last five, was it five months now, so... Uh, but I'm nearing the end of my time, so I have to go back to the real world and uh, teaching and all that stuff. So I've uh, been busy and been had a good opportunity to give a couple talks like these to talk about my work, uh, to talk about laptop music, and to talk about uh, granular processing and that sort of stuff too. So um, just to kind of I gotta get started, I wanted to play an example for you of uh, my work. So this is going to be a little bit weird. I'm not actually going to perform live on laptop for you. I'm going to show you a video of me performing live on laptop. So this is a mediated performance of, yeah, anyway, it, it's bizarre. I, I, underst I understand if you're confused like I am, but uh, I think it's, it'll be uh, good to show you, though, because it's actually a video capture of my screen while I'm performing. Uh, so you're actually going to see what my MaxMSP performance patch uses. MaxMSP is the main software that I've used. I've been using MaxMSP for... 15 years now. Max has only been around for 25 years. So thankfully it's going to be around for another 20 years, but I don't know. Uh, here we've got uh, what my uh, performance patch looks like, and I can uh, show you. This is a little performance that I put together. I gave a lecture down in Frankfurt, uh, and they asked me to do a lecture and a performance in 15 minutes, which is a pretty tight time schedule, yes. Um, but So I did a little kind of demonstration using my typical laptop performance patch uh, I pulled up four sounds, and actually I can, well, I'll see if I can find those four sounds. I, I took four sounds and made a piece out of just those four sounds, because my, my, my theme for my talk was that any sound can become material for music, and I'll kind of hit on that again here as well. Uh, so taking just these four sounds, so there's the first one, there's the second one. Right. So taking those four sounds, I then used my performance patch to kind of rework them live in performance. And so uh, this will be interesting because you're actually going to see the patch and you've got a little video of me performing along with the patch, uh, how I work things. And you'll actually, you'll, I, I think you'll get kind of what some of the cues on screen are. So let me go ahead and play this for you and we can talk a little bit afterwards.
So, uh, yeah, and I can even, uh, I'll tell you, I, I flubbed the ending there, so I, there was a little, the bell was supposed to come back one last time, and you can hear maybe uh, some of the experimenting that's going on there toward the end, because this is, this is a rehearsal. I mean, you can see, I'm, uh, this is actually in my hotel room in Frankfurt, practicing for the, uh, the, the lecture performance. Um, and I'm trying things out, seeing kind of what moves work, what moves don't work. Um, but I don't know, uh, questions that you have about what you're seeing up on screen or questions about what you're hearing or how it works? Do you guys have any questions at this point? Can you just uh, sketch out briefly how, uh, what different the parts of the patch is? Oh yeah, the okay, so the different parts of the patch. Uh, I've got up here, this is called the rhythm, well, I call it the rhythm bank, okay? So rhythm bank, okay. I can then, uh, I've got 64 steps across in the cycle. Uh, I can then tick off where I want certain things to do. So if I, let's see if I can mute this and then run back and play it. So you can see where I've got rhythms ticked off here. That's what the green, each row is a rhythm, okay. Okay. Uh, and I can fill in rhythms and change rhythms. Uh, there's other transform I kind of played stayed pretty st static. I was supposed to be doing like a four minute performance, so I didn't do get too fancy with what I can do in, in this. Um, these ticks at the top are like uh, allow me to like peck in certain rhythms basically. So if I don't want just like four and two and eight and those type, sorts of things, like right now I got you know four and seven. So you see how they kind of line up here at four and seven. So it allows me to kind of explore different rhythmic combinations, if you will. Uh, and then this is a patching matrix, so I can patch in the rhythms to my different sound producing devices down here, okay? Uh, and this one, again, I stripped it down. I'm just using my, my little tiny sampler, I call it. Uh, it's where I can drag and drop sound files, uh, and then I can change the window of what I'm playing, what part of the sound file I'm playing. Uh, I've got a band limiter, which basically gives me a high pass and a low pass filter that I can use to kind of rein in what part of the frequency spectrum I want. Uh, and then I've got a, an echo uh, mechanism here that I can add in. You may have heard that jump in and out at certain points. Uh, and these are, um, I guess, these allow me to randomize and or cycle through different settings on the parameters in this patch. So they're way, these are, uh, I guess, mechanisms for transforming settings on the actual tiny sampler, if you will. Okay. Um, so that's basically an overview of what, what it does, uh, what the performance patch does. Um, no, any other questions about? Yeah, well, sure. Because I think it was really interesting what you did. Yeah. Do you think, do you, uh, so do you have, uh, you, you played several different sounds. Mm -hmm. So do you have several uh, tiny samplers that Yeah, uh, so if you saw, there were a couple moments in the patch, so yeah, different tiny samplers. It looks like there's one layer, uh, but if you can see right in here, this A, S, D, F, I've built it so that on the keyboard, I, I'm actually, it's, it's a layering effect. Uh, this is one of the ways that I've, I mean, in performing with laptops, one of the things, you're, you're, you're fighting several things all the time. Uh, and one of the biggest things that you're fighting is screen real estate, right? You don't have enough uh, uh, area on the screen in order to fit all the parts of your, your instrument that you want to fit on, on the screen at any given time. So one of the things I've figured out how to do is actually use the keyboard to adjust uh, a layering effect. You may have seen there's like this black bar that went across the screen several times that showed like I, I, that I had pressed a key. Let's see if I can find one. There's one there. So yeah, it says, it says I pressed an F and it actually changed to this layer and it changed the sound file. So even though it, it looks the same, it's actually changing to a different layer in my patch at that moment. Uh, so that's changing to a different tiny sampler. And that's how I'm getting the four, sound, the four sounds that I played for you originally. Um, that's what I'm how I'm accessing the different sounds, basically, in the different samplers. And I have the same thing over here, A, J, and K on my keyboard, adjust the layers here. So that helps me overcome maybe some of the limitations of screen real estate. Okay? So you're just using your keyboard now. now. I do have, uh, that's what this is on the screen here. Yeah. I have a little uh, Korg, makes a nice little oh, yeah. nano controller, right? 
Uh, I have that kind of patched in, and so you can actually, this is just showing me where the, the sliders are on my uh, Korg physical controller. Just so I, I have that there for two reasons. One, so I have a, a visual feedback that it's actually receiving the messages. Uh, and two, uh, I, you can kind of see this area of the screen over here. I can assign it to different parameters in my performance patch. So with a, just by typing in the name of it, it connects it to a different uh, point in my patch. Uh, and I could change that mapping dynamically during the performance if I wanted to. But uh, for this, again, it was a, it's supposed to be a four minute performance. So there's not much time to get too fancy. I, I would try to make it straight ahead. Simple. Yep. In, hmm? in, in this routing, uh, uh, the zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yep. eight, nine, is that um, that way? That, that is the different rhythms that you have on the. Yeah, so this way it's the rhythms that you see in the rhythm bank. Ah. And then this these are the outlets on that module in my patch. So I can, I have, I think actually in this patch there's only five outlets connected to five tiny samplers. But I can connect up to 10 things to the rhythm bank and have them routed in different. So some of what you saw me doing over here when these purple dots were changing was actually changing which rhythm was going to which sound, basically. So I can change that dynamically as well. Um, I mean, I think one of the interesting things for me in working with music technology and with laptop performance is the ability to decouple like rhythm and pitch and have those be kind of, I guess, parameters that I can send to different sounds and different devices. Uh, that's, that's an interesting thing for me. So having rhythms mapped out that I can then send to different sounds is something that I like to play around with. How do you see which, uh, or how do you know which one is, uh, which sound is, I mean, from, from the, what you see on the screen? Do you just, uh, is there a way for you to just... Uh, uh, if I scroll back to where I'm at A, okay, that's that first kind of like wood hit mm -hmm. that you're seeing here in the blue area, um, which is giving me kind of the bass drum kind of effect. Uh, then this is that kind of swiping sound. Yeah. S is that layer. Right. So actually, basically, the, the different layers are, mm -hmm. the, are the different, are the different sounds that I played for you originally. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Mason is he's a he's a pretty accomplished programmer. He's done a, a pretty well known granular synthesis yep. for Max. Uh, but as, how much? How many of these modules did you create yourself? Uh, all of well, let's see. I think the only one I that isn't mine is this Echo one. That's part of and the panning and the Q script. So I've I've started building off of what's in Jamoma. Jamoma is another. Uh, group of Max MSP patches and some other things as well. But one of the things that it is is, is a set of modules for Max MSP that you can uh, download. And Tron Losius down in, at Bergen Center for Electronic Arts and uh, Alexander Repsen Jensenius, who's at University of Oslo, have both been involved in Jamoma development uh, quite a bit. And that's part, that was part of my reason for coming to Norway was to spend some time working with Tron and also get to meet Alexander and work with him a little bit. Uh, so, uh, but it's Jamoma that gives you the ability to make these kind of like block modules that you can then stack in your patch um, and uh, reuse them. So the, one of the reasons why the layers look the same is because it's the same uh, patch that you then load into your patch and reuse it. Make sense? No. So that's me performing. So let me talk a little bit about, I guess, uh, where this idea, um, I don't know, the, the idea that the, the laptop is an instrument. Uh, I think in certain circles, this is still a rather controversial idea, right? Uh, I don't know if they, maybe you're encountering this, the, the idea that I can walk on stage and perform with my laptop. And uh, we, we're not yet at the point where music schools are holding auditions on laptops, right, or anything like that. Uh, and you come in and you play your scales, right, on your laptop. Which, which would be really easy because you just program them and hit go and right, um, but I think uh, on a certain level there is a there is a sense at least in the United States where a lot of the press 
is uh, talking about the laptop as if it is an instrument. So when they're writing up reviews of gigs or uh, publicity in advance of gigs, they're talking about the instrument as if it is, uh, talking about the laptop as if it is an instrument. Uh, and so one of the things that I started getting interested in is where, to, where does this start, at least in, I, I'm looking primarily at the American press, but I've been kind of following the global press since then of different gig reviews from across the world uh, where people mention laptop music and talk about the laptop as if it's an instrument. Uh, so in terms of looking into early media coverage, I've actually traced it back to about 2001, 2002 uh, is where we start to see big uh, media outlets in the United States talking about the laptop as if it's an instrument. Okay, so it's we're about ten years past what I call what I think is the tipping point of American media covering the laptop as if it's a as if it's an instrument. Um, and if anything, I, I kind of look at this because uh, I I still like I said I encounter people that look at me kind of funny when I talk about the laptop as if it's an instrument, and I'd like look you know for ten years now the American media has been doing this. Uh, and you know, big institutions like the New York Times have been talking about the laptop as if it's an instrument. Um, so in 2001, uh, there was this article in the New York Times called Laptop Composing, where they talked about Herbie Hancock, right? A uh, well-known jazz performer, uh, adding an iBook to the arsenal of instruments in his uh, touring ensemble, okay? Uh, so again, equating the computer as an instrument. Uh, the, the, the rest of the article is talking about the kind of the idea of uh, the laptop as kind of a mobile studio, a mobile composing tool, if you will. Uh, but for them to kind of mention the iBook as being an instrument, you know, the predecessor to the modern MacBook, right? Um, but then you have kind of uh, what is one of the stereotypes, right? The idea of someone hunkered over the laptop, you know, performing, right? And all you see is their uh, you know the glow of the the screen on their face as they're kind of staring blankly into this, which I think was kind of interesting for me to play the video of myself doing that uh, for you all, rather than so I'm just sitting here watching myself do what uh, I do what I would typically be doing in performance. Uh, but if anything, I'm kind of staring at myself, staring through the screen. So it, that was an interesting kind of I don't know postmodern moment where things are kind of folding back <laughs> on themselves, right? Um, so yeah, but this. Even in 2001, we have kind of this, this, uh, this stereotype starting to be formed of, okay, it's not really interesting to watch someone staring at their computer, right? Um, 2002, NPR is the national public radio. They're, they're kind of the, uh, the, the government-owned, government-controlled uh, uh, media outlet uh, on the radio station in the United States. Um, so even then, they're talking about uh, the uh, and I've I've been told that this you have this expression too the that, that it's as interesting as grass growing right uh, okay so they're they're equating watching someone perform on laptop with uh, watching grass grow so it's it's not quite as interesting as a guitar solo or a piano solo or whatever okay um, so that I, it, it it was interesting to me that what we all have kind of accepted as a stereotype of laptop performance uh, it goes back to kind of this this. This tipping point as well, it enters into the, the dialogue in the American media of, of uh, talking about laptop performance and talking about it not being very interesting to watch. Okay, uh, Wired Magazine uh, had actually a cover story in 2002 called Songs in the Key of F12. So if you think about your keyboard, right? Okay, okay a nice little play, a pun, right? Um, but it ran with this kind of ominous subtitle that first you know, software turned the laptop into a musical instrument and now who's in control, this kind of man versus machine, you know, uh, I don't know, post-futurist kind of idea of, you know, the, the machine being taking over and being in control of things. Um, but it's actually a pretty good article and you can access this online. So if you're looking at kind of like early American media coverage of, of laptop um, music, Wired Magazine has this article uh, in their archives. Um, and it has a pretty good survey of both the New York scene and also the San Francisco scene of, of laptop performers um, out there kind of making electronic dance music on their laptops. Um, and then we have the New York Times in 2003 talking about uh, that, that uh, they were talking about this uh, open air series, which was kind of a um, 
I don't know. Well, jazz musicians have this, uh, and and also folk musicians have this uh, this uh, tradition, right, of everybody kind of getting together, bringing their instruments, and just having kind of jam sessions, if you will. Uh, in 2002, 2003, there was this series in New York of laptop musicians doing kind of the same thing. Everybody kind of showed up, and they'd take turns playing things for each other. They'd get tips on their software, that sort of stuff. Um, and interesting that it's happening kind of outside of the university, outside of the uh, academy, right? Um, I actually was a, as a, when I was a grad student, we had a similar thing going on in Chicago where we'd all kind of get together, we'd play things for each other, but we'd also kind of share tips and tricks and that sort of stuff. So, um, but yeah, the idea that it, it, it almost has kind of a folk tradition where people are kind of learning by word of mouth, if you will, uh, and sharing ideas, sharing tips with each other, okay? Um, so really, um, I think for me though, it's not so much the, uh, I think it's, it's easy to get lost in the idea that it's, you're making a statement about the technology. The laptop is the technology by which I'm making my music. Uh, but for me, what is more important is the idea that I can take uh, any sound and turn it into music. So I'm more interested in what the laptop lets me do than making a statement about the laptop being an instrument, right? It's because it's very easy to get lost in that idea of, okay, no, this is an instrument, and I will advocate for this instrument. It's not so much that as much as what it, what the laptop lets me do. It lets me take any sound and turn it into a material for music. So then I got me thinking about where does this idea of any sound come from? Um, it's hard not to talk about be a musician in the 20th century, especially an American musician in the 20th century, and not talk about John Cage. Uh, 2012 is the centennial of John Cage's birth. He was born in uh, 1912, so there's a lot of um, retrospective concerts going on in the U.S. and across the world, right, about, uh, with, about John Cage and his music. Um, but in 1937, uh, he gave a lecture called The Future of Music Credo, uh, which was then subsequently written down and republished in the 50s. Uh, and it had a lot of forward-looking ideas. Um, but one of the ideas that he um, puts forward in that is that the idea that in the future we'll have electronic, musics, uh, electronic music instruments that will allow us to access any sound and use it as material for music, uh, which I think is really kind of the, the idea that any sound is available for musical purposes. Okay, um, I really kind of trace that back to um, Cage in his 1937 uh, lecture, The Future of Music Credo. Um, how do we then connect that idea? I, I think that, that laptops are a kind of a realization of that electronic music instrument that lets you take any sound and turn it into music. Okay. Uh, how did we get to his, I mean, in 37 were pre-computers, right? 1930s or 1937. Uh, how do we get, how do we connect those kind of abstract ideas to the computer? Well, we can't talk about computer music without talking about Max Matthews. Uh, Max Matthews was a, a young engineer at, at Be working at Bell Labs uh, had access to the IBM mainframe computer, these computers that occupied whole rooms like this size, possibly even bigger. I, I've not walked in one of these rooms, and so but I only see them in pictures. That They're huge, these mainframes. Um, but he was kind of stealing hours after work, uh, working on these uh, experiments and turning, uh, uh, writing instructions to make the computer make sound. Okay, uh, and he saw the possibility of um, this being a generalized uh, to where any sound can be produced by computers. Okay, he he wrote in 1963. He talked about you know uh, the ones and zeros that computers uh, speak can be used to describe any sound. Therefore, any sound can be made by computers. Okay, so to me, it's kind of connecting the dots between 1937. And then 1957, um, if I was really more into numbers, I would point out that I was born in 1977. So it's kind of a 20-year progression here, basically. So, uh, so yeah, it, you know, if you're kind of into that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, I do think that it's, it's this, this exciting potential of what the tools let you do, not just the fact that I'm using, uh, I'm this futurist who's using whatever technological means I can get my hands on to make computers because I believe that that's the future and you know acoustic instruments are a dead art form. I, I mean, I'm fond of saying that you know if if um, I don't want to get to that point yet. Um, you know, if I wanted to write 
music for clarinet, I would probably compose something for clarinet and hand it off to a clarinet player. I wouldn't use a clarinet synthesizer to substitute for that because I want the sound of a clarinet, so I want to get a clarinet player to play it for me. I'm more interested in taking sounds that are not necessarily thought of as musical and repurposing them and reusing them and turning them into music. Okay, um, That's kind of where I'm going. Now, when I make music with laptops, I played a solo performance for you. I, I typically don't play laptop computer by myself. Uh, we have a, an ensemble at, uh, or a group at um, Stetson called Mobile Performance Group. Uh, my colleague Matt Roberts uh, came up with the idea uh, of taking laptops out into public spaces and doing performance, doing audiovisual performances. So he does mainly VJ type work, if you're familiar with that, doing live visual performance. Uh, I do m mainly live audio performance, so the idea is that we could kind of team up and do performances out in public uh, through this group MPG. Um, and when we talk about in the idea of any sound, we usually talk about the idea of place. So we've been we've traveled all over the U.S. Um, doing performances, and what we usually do is we turn the place into the subject of our performance. So we'll in stage one, we'll like actually hit the city with recording equipment. Uh, we'll go out and we'll capture as many sounds as possible. So these are some of my students uh, with their gear on out, going out to collect things. And we, we do this not just by ourselves. We do this with our students uh, as a kind of a, a good exercise for them to kind of uh, work with the technology and in, in, in performance. Uh, go out and capture sounds around the city. Uh, we then take that material back to the hotel and uh, we'll sit and we'll edit on our laptops, get the material down into usable chunks. Uh, these are my students doing audio capture, but... Uh, Matt students will typically have be out with their videos and uh, video cameras and their audio, uh, or excuse me, their their still cameras, right, taking pictures around the city that they use as part of their VJ performance as well. Uh, and then when we perform, we will only use that material that we collected from the city in our performance. So we go back out into the streets and do our performance uh, outdoors. Uh, you can see Matt here up in the upper right hand corner. That's that's him uh, and myself there. Uh, performing in Miami here. This is actually in San Jose over on the other side here. Um, and we've gotten, we've also got a little bit of a reputation because we use uh, these shopping carts. Uh, so we, we, we use the shopping carts to throw all our gear in. Uh, everything, and we are then mobile. That's how we're a mobile performance group, uh, which is also nicely in the U.S. because we, we, uh, we gauge our car's efficiency by miles per gallon. So it's also supposed to be a play on that acronym, MPG. Um, uh, some of our early performances, we actually were using cars. That's kind of where the idea came up from. We use the sound system in the in the automobile and and actually project on the the, the rear windshield of uh, driving around the city. Um, but then we kind of landed on this shopping cart idea, which seems to uh, uh, resonate with a lot of people. Uh, moving around the city in shopping carts and then connecting everything up. We have a sound system that's made of uh, repurposed car stereo parts, uh, and it all runs off of a car battery. Uh, basically, so uh, we can do our performances, uh, and you can kind of see there's an inflatable back here. Uh, this is a kind of uh, I don't know. They, in the U.S., we sell them as kind of a painting your painter's drop cloths. So when you're painting your house, you can make sure you keep it off the floor and the carpet. Uh, but the material is kind of translucent. So if you uh, Take two of them and heat the edges. You can make a big balloon that you can then project on, and it's viewable 360 degrees all the way around. So it's quite nice as a as a kind of portable inflatable screen that you can make at the location. Uh, and you just bring a little fan to hook it up and blow it up. So it's it's quite nice to do performances with that as well. We'll also project on sides of buildings. So we'll look at you know find a nice big white space and project on it. Um, so we usually are out performing at night for that reason. Although Trumpsa would be a good location, right? Because you've got a lot of you've got a lot of uh, very little daylight out here, so we could be performing in the afternoon. Right? So anyway, uh, thought note to self. Okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, I wanted to play uh, uh, a performance uh, clip from us performing. So what you're going to see here, you're not going to see video of us actually out on the streets. You're going to see video of what the projections looked like. Uh, this we did in in Miami. We were in an area of Miami where there's a lot of graffiti art. Uh, and we, there are actually a lot of discarded spray paint cans, so we actually were using the spray paint cans uh, to, to hit as percussion instruments. 
Uh, what's nice about them, because you have different sizes and different, uh, they have different tones to them, so you can use them as rhythmic devices. Uh, so we were actually doing some pre-capturing and some live looping if you, uh, with, the, with the spray paint cans. So performing on the street, hitting them, but I had a max patch set up that could record what I was playing over one rhythmic cycle, and then it would just keep playing it over and over again, much like uh, these looping pedals that you see that are sold commercially. So uh, this is spray paint can with uh, MPG. Let me pull this up. Go full screen. And then back. So that gives you an idea of what, what you would see projected on either the building or the um, or the inflatable that we use as well. And you can get here some of the uh, layers there. So all of the sounds you hear, let me think. I think even the kick drum sound is a paint can that was just shifted, pitch shifted way down. Um, the kind of droning that you hear was actually a, an air conditioning unit that we landed upon uh, that kind of ring almost kind of on a didgeridoo kind of sound it's actually an air conditioner uh, I mean we're really interested in this this aesthetic of you know collecting you know everyday sounds out in the city and, and using them in performance so um, I don't know, any questions about MPG or do you get a, get a sense of what we're doing there uh, how long do you, does it take like if you travel to a new location in yeah. town and, uh, how much time do you have 
until the performance. Yeah, we there. usually we usually do it over a three day period. So we'll go out. I mean, first day we get there, we'll usually go out and collect. We'll often go back to the hotel and start editing and. If we realize we need more material, we'll go out the next day again and collect and then finish up editing. Uh, and usually by the night of the second, we're, we're improvising with the material in the hotel room, kind of trying to figure out what sounds good together, what looks good together, that sort of stuff. Um, for that reason, we've built kind of patches, and my students have built patches. That's part of, I mean, this is, again, the, their educational outcome, right? They have to build instruments that... Uh, can work with sounds and throw. They can throw sounds at them like samplers, like my uh, samplers that you saw, um, pretty quickly to be able to change sounds and figure out what sounds good together, what doesn't sound good together. Um, I do give them the the rhythmic component. I give them that part of my patch, and I and then I have another patch that allows us to communicate over a network so that our all of our clocks are synchronized. Um, but they're responsible for building the sound producing mechanisms. So all they're getting is a little click, like a pulse, basically, that tells them when to play. Uh, they've got to turn that into musical sounds, basically. Um, so yeah, the, the actual building of the instruments has to happen before we get to the city. Uh, they have to have worked on that and built those up. And we'll usually do kind of some, some trials with local sounds so they get a feel for how their instruments work. They can make tweaks, but they're often making tweaks to their instruments right before the performance as well, too. So, um, yeah, it's a good way to learn. <laughs> to, kind of have a, to have a performance deadline is a good way to learn. Yeah. So, yeah, that, I think I talked through the timeline. So, yeah, after the second day, we're usually improvising, and we'll kind of figure out, I don't know, three to four kind of moves or grooves or feels basically um, uh, and they're usually things that we can kind of just jam on over an extended period of time uh, one thing we found when we're out on the street let me pull it back up my uh, keynote here when we're out on the street performing okay uh, I, I don't know if this is a function of the fact that we're using laptops or the fact that we're out on the street or, or what but people feel uh, okay walking up to us and asking so what are you doing you know Unlike if we we're there with like guitars or whatever, that you know, there's that, I don't know, that unspoken rule of like musical performance, like you don't interrupt the musician while they're performing. People don't get that with a laptop ensemble out on the street. They they think that you're just kind of, I don't know, queuing up sound files or whatever, right? Maybe it relates back to the same uh, stereotype that we uh, I talked about when I talked about media coverage that people don't quite understand that your actions are impacting what they're hearing and seeing. Um, so yeah, one of the other things my students have to get really good at is explaining really quickly what they're doing so they can get back to performing. So, um, and also building uh, generative elements into their patch so that they can kind of flip it over into generative mode. So it'll, it'll make some changes while they're talking to somebody. Uh, that sort of thing. It also it doesn't end up being too bad because uh, if we're all making as much sound as we possibly can, it ends up sounding pretty cacophonous, as you can imagine. Uh, because a lot, that's one of the things with a laptop. It, it, you, 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 one laptop can make a lot of noise, and then, and then if you throw three or four at the problem, they're making a lot, even more noise. So it actually ends up being a good thing if somebody steps out and talks to whoever is asking questions to kind of explain who we are and what we're doing. So, other questions about MPG? Any questions about what I'm talking about overall? I can play more music for you, but I, I want to make sure we don't move past. Yeah, questions. Yeah. Um, uh, we're talking about you know the, this uh, this uh, stereotype of the laptop musician. Yeah, yeah. So I, I see that a lot of people are, are building their own controllers. Right. Uh, have you worked anything with that? Have yeah, I think I think uh, not building my own kind of like. Uh, controller, but I think my my venturing into live looping was trying to answer that problem. So people, ha I found that people had a much different response to me with the fact that I had a microphone and I was hitting spray paint cans into the microphone. They got okay, yes, he's performing something. Here, you know, um, same thing with you can see we have water bottles there. We were actually explore exploring the water bottles as well because they make nice deep resonant tones. Uh, I think actually one of my favorite sounds that I got. I'm not, if you take the microphone. 
shove it into the mouth of the water bottle and then put the water bottle up to the speaker. You get the feedback whoop, but you get kind of a tone out of the, the water bottle. That was one of my favorite sounds that I discovered from these things. Uh, so I just tidbit there. Uh, ways to shape feedback, you know, much like you would with an electric guitar, shape feedback. You can shape feedback with any kind of resonant body. Um, yeah, so the live looping was my kind of attempt to kind of uh, step out of just controlling the laptop. Um, I think the the farther we get into it, yeah, we're going to have to push in that direction because uh, you, you can't just use the the keyboard and the trackpad, even though you see us using just the keyboard and the trackpad over here on the left-hand side, right? Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, we've got, there's a joystick here, you can see in this picture. So using that as a controller as well to shape things. Uh, I, you can see my nano controller here. Um, usually my students will pick up some sort of, you know, slider bank or whatever. But as far as like building our own kind of custom instruments, we haven't quite gotten into that. Um, one of the interesting things my colleague has done with uh, the, is he'll use you know Apple for a while before they started embedding these lovely webcams. They started making that little eyesight camera, uh, which uh, he likes connecting that to his computer and then using that to kind of explore surfaces and in live and real time performance. So those actually can be quite nice webcams. For the the visual side, the video side of things, but um, yeah, I think more and more we're gonna have to kind of think about how we build our own controllers for for performance. Up until this point, it's been kind of re on the musical side, it's been repurposing things, so repurposing game joysticks, repurposing these kind of uh, keyboard uh, knob slider banks, basically. So. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking a bit about uh, uh, this uh, program, uh, Mac Max and mm -hmm. SP. Yeah. Uh, because, well, uh, why use that uh, instead of Ableton Live or uh, Max for Live? Oh, uh, yeah. Or, uh, I don't know. Well, partly, it, well, for me, partly it's one of uh, time with the software. So the fact that I've been using Max since 97. You know, I, I know it quite well, uh, and I can I can whip up something pretty quick. And and I think where Max MSP gets really useful is when you start building your own modules that you can then reuse. So I mean, you know, if you if you've ever experimented, there's this facility to build kind of uh, what are called B patchers, where you can actually build a little interface that you then embed in your patch, and it's actually doing something behind the scenes. I think. Um, to start from scratch with Max MSP object, there's just the off-the-shelf section of before objects. You get, you can get pretty frustrated pretty quickly because it's at, it's at a very low level building things. But once you start building, you know, your filter that works the way you want it to work, and then you can reuse it in your pat in your various performance patches, uh, then it gets really useful because you, you build up a library of these things. Um, and partly, what interests me in Jamoma is that people are it, through Jamoma sharing their library of these patches. Uh, Jamoma provides a way to standardize them so that they all talk to one another very easily. Um, so my filter could talk to your echo unit that you built because they're, they're using a common uh, communication scheme. Um, so yeah, that's, that's part of the reason what was, what was interested me in Jamoma is it, when you start building these modules for yourself, uh, you eventually build up a lot. I've been doing it long enough that I've got a library of them. That I've, okay, I've got my sampler, I've got my filter, I've got my uh, echo that I like. Um, and maybe, you know, I had this idea for it. What I, what I like about Max is um, unlike off-the-shelf plugins, if I've got this idea for how I want to tweak the interface or change its behavior, all I have to do is unlock the patch, and I'm I'm in. I can start reworking things, uh, as opposed to a an audio units plugin or a VST plugin that somebody else has built. I don't have access to the source code. I can't go do that. And and even if I did have access to the source code, it's uh, uh, if you, I don't know if you've ever done any C plus plus programming and development. It's you're you're several stages removed from getting to the the being able to rework things. It's a lot harder process to rework things the way you want than it is in Max MSP because you just, because the interface is the program, is the patch, is everything, 
you just unlock and you're there and you can start re reworking things. It just it feels more tangible than going over to the source code where okay, here's where the slider is defined in this .h file and here's where the pro I mean I've done that too, uh, um, because when I when I get to the limits of what MaxMSP can do, well then the next step is to go into C programming and C++ programming and build your own Max externals. Um, and you can do you can step into that level as well too. So, but what about yeah. if you're kind of in the in, in between, like you use like Ableton Live, mm -hmm. because you have this uh, Max for Live yeah. thing, is that sort of able to do sort of the same things? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's able to do some of the same things, and and uh, I guess for me, I'm not opposed to it. I mean, I I bought Live actually this past summer, and I'm trying to get into Max for Live. Uh, and using it because there are some nice things that Ableton does that uh, it does just really well, you know. Um, so I've actually started experimenting with transporting some of my um, some of my modules into Max for Live plugins, um, and I think that might be where I'm going in the future. Especially for for MPG, I mean, it was an aesthetic decision to do this kind of beat oriented music because if you're doing street performance and you're doing kind of like avant-garde electroacoustic music. It doesn't really go over well with people on the street. So <laughs> beat-driven music kind of hooks them in and they want to kind of stick around and bop their heads and hang out. And uh, San Jose, we actually had some break dancers show up and start break dancing with us. It was, was, was bizarre and awesome at the same time. Um, but I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I want to explore that more in the future. It's just, uh, I've, uh, if anything, uh, been, committed to some other projects that haven't really allowed me to dive into Ableton as much as I want to. I've bought it. It's on my hard drive. I just need time to study it and work, on it, work at it some more before I start using it. Um, but I think some of the things I haven't been able to do well, that I don't see how to do yet in Ableton, is this kind of, uh, I don't know, in some ways it's a, it's a very old idea of pulling the rhythm apart from the pitch sequence. So maybe you have a rhythmic sequence that has five beats in it, but you have a pitch sequence that has seven pitches in it, and hearing how they kind of cycle one on top of the other so that you get these interesting changes. I mean, it's, a, it's an idea that goes back to the Renaissance, Renaissance music, doing those kind of, with motets, they did that kind of stuff. Um, I'm interested in exploring some of those things, and the fact that the computer lets me do it so fast, I can hear the results right away. I don't have to write it all out in notation and then wait till the rehearsal next week with the choir and prop it down to hear what it's going to sound like. I can hit go, and actually, I can hit go, and I can be tweaking it while I'm hearing it. You know, that that kind of sped up feedback loop is uh, I'm I'm all over that. I, I love that. So. And, and Max lets me do that pretty quickly. Yeah. Want me to play one more thing for you? Okay. I'm looking at the clock. I, I can see the clock in the back of the room. We're about we're getting close to an hour, so I can play one more thing for you. Uh, you John heard this in Oslo, so Attack, I think, would be a good one to play for them. Yeah? Okay. Uh, I also do some stuff working with uh, digital audio workstations. I, I, have to, I teach my students how to use digital audio workstations. It's not just Max MSP and modular programming environments, right? Um, so I was trying to think of a way to kind of, uh, I don't know, brush up. In some ways, uh, brush up on my skills in the digital audio workstation and kind of get in there and play around with it. But also to think of an exercise that I could also feed to my students as well. Um, I also was kind of contemplating this idea of the, the mobile music collection that we all carry around with us nowadays. You know, there, most people have an iPod with a digital music collection that has hours and hours of music on it, right? That you would, you know, you would have to spend several days listening to it to hear all of it. Um, and also thinking about the idea that this is a, uh, these are sound files that are locked, you know, thinking back to that any sound, right? Okay. If any sound is available for music composition, but I've got this collection of sound files that's supposed to be for consumption, not production, right? What can I do to play with these sound files that are in, in, 
in some respects, they're supposed to be off limits, right? You're supposed to just consume them, not use them for production, right? We're getting into issues of sampling and copyright, right? Okay. How can I do something interesting with those? So I came up with this idea for Attack in 2011. Um, and it actually exists as a score. So if you want to download the score, you can go to my website. It's available under Creative Commons license, so you're free to share it and uh, use it. So I've got instructions on how to do this. The material is supposed to be your sound, your MP3 collection, your sound file collection, uh, but you're only allowed to use the beginning of the first sound of every track and then string them together into a composition, basically. So this is the kind of the composition here as in its score-based form. This is the composition in uh, my rendering that I did. It's a little over five minutes. So you can hear kind of some, uh, some examples of this, how this works. I mean, the key... Uh, where it helps you refine your digital audio workstation skills, you've got to crop the sound files so you don't get any pops or clicks, right? You've got to catch it right at the... There's, there's no fades in this file. This is only sounds that I've dropped in, and then I've cropped them to the, from the beginning of the first sound to about through the attack, right? Thinking about uh, attack, decay, sustain, release, right? Um, so cropping it at just the right moment so you catch it going through the zero line right so that you don't get a pop or click okay so this is attack You, you support? Hi. This Darling. Right about.
The pack. Bust. Now the Thank you. So, I don't know. Do you have any other questions or? How many songs are that? Oh, how many? Uh, gosh, I don't know. I know that I did not go. Oh, what is that? Okay. Oh, get back in here. I know that I didn't make it all the way through my uh, iTunes library before I hit the. Because I was. It was a piece I was doing for a concert and we had a five minute slot for this piece. So I got to five minutes. I was like, okay, I'll have to do attack two some other day. It's basically. So yeah, I still have to finish going through my collection. Um, I did, uh, I mean a little bit kind of, I guess the process of how to speed up the, this, uh, putting this together. Uh, because if you were to try to da uh, copy your entire iTunes collection into pro tools, it'll take forever ready you know it goes through that process of readying the files and everything uh, imagine doing that with however many thousands of songs are in your iTunes library and you get an idea how it might choke uh, so uh, I used Amadeus first to go through because Amadeus is a shareware program kind of like peak if you've ever used peak but it has a batch processor you can point it at a, at a, a folder and and set up a batch process for what you want to do to those files and so I had it go through my iTunes library first and strip off the first, um, I think, five seconds or seven seconds, something like that. Because some, some tracks have silence at the beginning of them, right? But I wanted to make sure I captured the first sound. So I had to do, I had to overcompensate a little bit. Um, then, so that dumped into a folder with all of the, you know, the first five seconds of every track. Then I pulled that into Pro Tools, which was much faster than trying to download the whole iTunes library. So there, there's a multi-step process there, basically. But, I mean, the only... Uh, the only stipulation of the score is that don't let any idea ever finish, basically. Um, so uh, you can hear all, all these things kind of just get started. Um, but it's amazing how you're playing it in a room like this. Everybody recognizes at least one track in there, yes? Okay. Uh, there's at least one thing in that collection that you, you recognize. And you're only ever hearing probably at, at, at most a second of it. Um, and it's amazing how that plays on our, I'm also interested in music perception at, at, sometimes, uh, and it's amazing how playing just such a short bit of a song can trigger the memory of it and you, you know what it is instantly. 
So, yeah. Yeah, it must be the world's hardest music quiz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine playing that yeah, for, for my students, yeah. Okay, go. <laughs> I just figure this out. <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah, yeah figure all these Less out. Less than 50%. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that it would be fair, because some of them are... Um, I've I had some student projects make it into my collection along the way, because I, I often... Uh, uh, you know, I, I have so many students making so many projects, I can't sit in my office and listen to all of them all, all the time because I'd be there for hours. So sometimes I'll offload them onto my iPod and I'll listen to them while I'm in the gym or biking into work and that sort of stuff just to, and then I'll listen, I'll read, I'll do like a first listening and then do like a close listening in my office. But that way at least I'm not in my office listening to them three or four times to hear everything. So, yeah. So some of the things that would be impossible to identify because they're a student project that was like, in week five of two years ago, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But some of them they should know, like you know, I think spells like Teen Spirits in there. That's one that you should know that crunchy guitar at the beginning, yeah. So, um, yeah. So I wanted to hear at the beginning of the uh, can, like, sorry about that, but uh, yeah, uh, you're talking about students. How mm -hmm. many students do you have at that? How well, so yeah, I'm teaching um, undergraduate students, uh, so they're between, well, typically they're between like 18 and 22. Um, I have a few kind of returning students that are coming back to get a bachelor's degree, and they, they can be older, up closer to 30. Um, but yeah, I have, I think currently in my program, about 28 students. Uh, I've been north of that around 35. Uh, and much like Jan Marius here, I'm I'm the only one teaching music technology. So when we get, when we got up to 35, I was like, help. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but that's that's about how many students I have. And you know, I try not to make our program about just doing music technology one way. And I try as much as possible to expose them to different ways of using music technology, uh, and helping them find that that one way that makes the most sense for them where they're going to be able to do something you know fulfilling for the rest of their lives uh, because not everybody's a, a DAW person you know not everybody's a Maxim SP person not everybody's a live sound person uh, uh, but we all have these common things like microphones like speakers like you know uh, music just theory in general you know th those types of things that we all kind of have in common um, and I try to I guess encourage a, a, an atmosphere of gen mutual respect for what everybody's doing, um, and give them as much possibility, as much opportunity to network with each other, uh, because I'm, I make sure that you know once you move on from university, you might be the ultimate, you know, DAW person, but you're going to encounter a situation where you need a live sound person, and you want to be able to call on that classmate that you had back at the university, uh, if not to use them as a contact. To, to find out who they know that can help you out in a given situation. So, um, yeah, the, the contacts you build at university uh, can sustain you for quite a long ways out in the real world. Um, even when you get spread out, uh, those guys, I mean, it just, it, it's been amazing to me also uh, following my students on Facebook, you know, because some of them have bands and they'll tour. And it's like, okay, who's in Boston now? You know, so they'll hit them up for a place to crash after the gig, basically. Uh, and it's because they knew each other in school down in Florida, you know, that they can do those kind of things. So yeah, I have one student that, like, he, he takes his band on tour. He never pays for a hotel because he always finds somebody to crash on their floor, basically. So, you know, he'll go up the East Coast and back down, basically. So, so. well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.